Hey, welcome. My name is Rachel Smith, and this is the Natural Health Rising podcast. I am a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and the owner of Natural Health Rising, which is my online holistic functional medicine company where I help people who have autoimmune diseases, chronic illnesses, mystery symptoms, and a whole host of other imbalances restore their health by natural means. On this podcast, you're going to hear conversations between myself and other health experts on functional medicine and general holistic health. My goal is to provide you with the tools you need in order to help you rise to your healthiest and happiest self. So on this episode, I have Dr. Brianne Callanan with me. Dr. Callanan is a naturopathic doctor who focuses on hormones, gut health, and resistant weight loss. She is an author, international speaker, as well as the creator of the Metabolic Reset Program. Dr. Callanan believes in getting to the root cause of health concerns and using a holistic approach to healing. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Mm-hmm. Brian, what made you become a naturopathic doctor in the first place? Great question. So I actually didn't have any experience with the medical system up until the point that I was pregnant with my first child. I was always very healthy. Um, Everything was great in terms of my health. After I gave birth to my son, I went to the doctor because I was experiencing all sorts of different symptoms that I had never experienced before. I had a hard time losing the baby weight. I felt really anxious. My energy was really low. And at that point in time, I had some basic testing done. And it was really just brushed off as, you know, this is part of being a mom. This is what happens when you get older, given I was only 20 when I had my son. So I thought, you know, that possibly can't be the case. And it really started my process of learning about holistic healthcare and functional medicine and looking at those labs from a different reference range, because even though my labs were quote unquote normal, I absolutely didn't feel normal. And I wasn't going to take that as this is going to be the rest of my life. So I really dove into functional testing and having a full thyroid panel done and looking at hormones and focusing on insulin resistance. And from there just made it my passion to help others who might be experiencing the same, same symptoms. That's wonderful. Um, Not wonderful about the getting brushed off thing. I definitely hear that a lot with my clients too. It's like, as soon as they have a baby, the doctor's just like, oh yeah, totally normal to feel like crap and have everything out of whack. Like that's just how it's got to be type of thing, Mm -hmm. which is not what we want to hear. So can you share a little bit more? Like what was it for you when you started to dig a little bit deeper? What was really triggering those symptoms that were coming up? So when I finally did the full thyroid panel, so what I find is conventionally only a small fraction of the thyroid is actually looked at, which we call a TSH. So the TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, that simply tells us, is the brain communicating with the thyroid gland? It doesn't tell us, is the thyroid even listening? How much actual hormone is the thyroid producing? So when I ran the full thyroid panel, I had something called subclinical hypothyroidism, where the brain was communicating just fine, but the thyroid wasn't listening. I had very low levels of free T3, which is one of the really important thyroid hormones for all of the functions. I also had elevated thyroid antibodies, which we know signifies Hashimoto's, and that's an autoimmune condition that impacts the thyroid gland. On all of my patients, I like to run the antibodies because there is some evidence to show elevated antibodies can be present up to 10 years before the TSH is impacted. So maybe you don't require treatment of your thyroid at this moment, but knowing that you have those antibodies present can really help us with diet and lifestyle changes that might be recommended, or at the very least, just say, okay, we know the antibodies are there. So every year we need to repeating and paying a really close attention to the thyroid gland because there is the risk that it might change in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also in my past have dealt with Hashimoto, so I totally get that as well. Um, what are some typical things if that does come up and you see those antibodies, what's the 
first plan of action for that person, whether it's nutrition or lifestyle change? So I like to take a holistic approach, right? So looking at everything is interconnected. And the first thing that we want to recognize is that a significant portion of the immune system lives in the gut. So having a look at digestive function, perhaps looking at the gut microbiome, doing some comprehensive stool testing to see what's going on there. Is there any dysbiosis or imbalances between the good and perhaps the opportunistic bacteria that we need to look at? Vitamin D is an important one for the immune system. Iron plays a role in thyroid function. There's also a connection between insulin resistance and your blood sugar and your thyroid gland. So that's something I pay attention to. And, and we see studies, especially, of course, in women looking at PCOS and the connection between PCOS and, and Hashimoto's. So blood sugar, of course, is a factor there too. In terms of nutrition, I do find that many individuals with an autoimmune thyroid condition do benefit from more of a paleo style nutrition plan. And this is not a one size fits all approach. Not every single person has to be gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, you know, all of the, the free things that we think of, but perhaps doing an initial trial of saying, okay, let's remove those inflammatory foods for a period of time, then reintroduce them one by one to see perhaps, are you reacting to some of those foods? And maybe we can pinpoint two or three that would be helpful for you to avoid. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. of course, the stress and sleep portion is foundational for any type of autoimmune condition. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned insulin resistance. Can you explain a little bit more for our listeners what is insulin resistance and the implications that has on our health? Absolutely. So insulin resistance is a very prevalent condition now in North America, and many individuals don't even realize that they have it. Insulin resistance comes before prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. What happens in insulin resistance is your, cell, your cells stop responding to insulin. So what does this mean? What does this actually look like? When you consume carbohydrates, whether it's fruit and vegetables or unhealthy carbohydrates like breads and pastas, those carbohydrates are going to be broken down into sugar or glucose, and that's going to raise your blood sugar. This is all normal. When the blood sugar rises, that signals to the pancreas to make the hormone insulin. And the role of insulin is to take the sugar from the bloodstream and get it into your cells. You want the sugars to go into your cells so that you can think, so your muscles can work, so you can burn that sugar as energy so that you can feel good and easily maintain your weight. In insulin resistance, the cells don't respond to insulin. So the sugar can't get into the cells. So all the body knows to do is make more and more and more insulin in an attempt to get your blood sugar down. So on one hand, the insulin, when it goes up and up and up, it's trying to protect the body from prediabetes. That's the good thing. But if your body is having to produce three times the amount of insulin to keep your blood sugar under control, that's problematic because the high insulin can cause increased weight gain, fatigue. It can change your hormones in both men and women. So in women, this is where we classically see the impacts of PCOS or we see that women are not ovulating or their testosterone's a little bit higher, they're having irregular periods. And with higher levels of insulin, not only do you see weight gain, especially around the midsection, but you can see hair loss on the head, you can see acne, you can see darkening of the skin, um, either around the neck or the, the elbows or behind the knees. So there's a variety of different symptoms that we might suggest are related to your hormones or symptoms related to your gut health or your thyroid doesn't work as well, but they can all be tied back to your blood sugar and this insulin resistance condition that we're seeing more and more of. Mm -hmm. What are the most important tests that someone needs to get to check if they have insulin resistance? So insulin resistance can be tested for on a simple blood test. So conventionally, what is run is something called the hemoglobin A1C. And this tells us how you've been maintaining your blood sugar over three months. 
This is not enough to diagnose insulin resistance because again, maybe you're having really high insulin and that's keeping your average under control. So you want to know what your average blood sugar is, but we also want to run a fasting insulin to see where that is. So fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and hemoglobin A1C would be a great start. But when we're looking at blood work, this is where the holistic approach comes into play. We wanna know where your thyroid is. We wanna know where your iron and vitamin D are because that can make your insulin levels worse. Where's your cortisol, your stress hormone? Because that will impact your insulin and your blood sugar. So ideally, it's great to look at everything as a whole because one thing does impact the other. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that people can prevent or even start to reverse insulin resistance if that's possible? Yeah, so we do know that there is a genetic component to insulin resistance. So if you have a family history of insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, obesity, there is that genetic component. But we do know that we can change the way that genes are expressed through diet and lifestyle. So looking at the foundation first, healthy whole foods. Are you getting enough diversity of vegetables? Are you getting healthy fats and protein? That's key. We also want to look at what's your stress levels like? Are you sleeping? Do you have hobbies? Do you have a sense of purpose? Do you have joy? Because if you aren't having a strong foundation in terms of your mental, emotional side of your life, it's going to be really hard to make those appropriate food choices. Insomnia or losing out on even an hour of sleep a night or not having a really good consistent sleep routine can impact your blood sugar. Not only do we see that the insulin resistance gets worse with lack of sleep, but of course your hunger and satiety cues get worse if you're not having good sleep quality too. So it'll be harder to stick to that healthy whole food nutrition plan. Resistance training is fantastic for insulin resistance too, but there's a fine line with exercise where we don't want you to overexercise or overexert your body where you're creating higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol or more inflammation or just not giving your body enough downtime to rest and recover. So you can't out supplement all of these lifestyle things. You can't out medicate all of the foundational lifestyle aspects. So that's going to be first. Then we do have both supplement and medication options for insulin resistance. There's things like berberine, inositol, metformin, semaglutides, and each treatment option is going to carry its own unique risk benefit analysis for each patient. So what we want to have a look at is presenting each patient all of their options because that's where I feel that individuals can truly make an informed choice where we say, okay, here's where your labs are. Here's what we think is going on. And then here are the benefits and risk of the supplement options and what the evidence has to say, diet, lifestyle, as well as the benefits and risks of conventional medicine too. There's a time and place for, for medications for each individual. And it's always important for the individual to feel like they've been given all of the information to make an informed choice. So we review that in a patient consult and then the individual gets to choose what they would like to do. And typically we're looking at repeating the labs in three months time to make sure that what we're doing is working and we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about the risk benefit analysis between metformin and say something that's a little bit more natural, like the inositol or berberine? Yeah, for sure. So there is comparative studies between berberine and metformin, which is great. They do look to be um, similar in efficacy between the two in the realm of improving the hemoglobin A1C or that average blood sugar in three months time. The metformin classically has some side effects that could include digestive upset, diarrhea, and there is about 5% of the patient population who takes that medication that cannot tolerate it. Mm. Berberine seems to be better tolerated, although if we look at how much research is done on natural health products versus pharmaceuticals, for a variety of reasons, oftentimes the pharmaceuticals will have stronger um, length of time and more research done on them just because of funding. 
the dosages of berberine that we classically see in research is anywhere between one to two grams in divided dosages with meals. Berberine has some interesting additional benefits in terms of it seems to modify the gut microbiome because it does have antimicrobial impacts. We know that certain types of gut bacteria are more associated with metabolic issues. So for instance, low acromantia, mucinophila, has been associated with insulin resistance, inflammation, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. So we do know that the gut bacteria plays a role in your metabolism, plays a role in the amount of calories you're absorbing from the foods you eat, plays a role in your blood sugar, plays a role in your inflammation. So that's an interesting side benefit that berberine may be working to reduce weight by modifying the gut microbiome. In terms of tolerability, the berberine is usually well tolerated, although some patients might experience some gas, bloating, diarrhea, and of course you always want to work with your primary care or functional medicine doctor to determine which one is going to be right for you before you start anything but it does have some favorable benefits on reducing hemoglobin A1C or your average blood sugar. The inositol is something that also has been shown to improve blood sugar control and insulin resistance. It also has research to support improving ovulation rates in PCOS patients or patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that's because we know the higher the levels of the insulin, the worse the hormones are going to be. Insulin has more research on it in terms of safety um, for preconception. So for patients who are looking to get pregnant, we know that inositol can be one that's used, whereas the berberine, we don't necessarily have safety data to support its use in pregnancy. So that's also something to consider. If you are using, whether it's a natural health product or a pharmaceutical, what are your fertility plans? And that's something that you should discuss with your doctor because not everything that is natural would be considered safe in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, you've mentioned PCOS quite a few times now, so I'd love to dive a little bit more into that. For someone who doesn't know, what are some common signs and symptoms of PCOS and how does someone figure out if they actually have it? Yeah. So PCOS, I don't love the name. The name is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the reason I don't like the name is because it implies that you have to have cysts on your ovaries to have PCOS, which is not the case. Mm. So you could have cysts on your ovaries that you can diagnose with an ultrasound, but you don't have to have them to have PCOS. Other signs of PCOS would be elevated androgens. So that is things like testosterone, DHEA. In women, we might see things like acne, hair growth on the face, hair loss on the head is another sign that those androgens are too high. And classically with PCOS patients, we see longer cycles or we see that patients are missing cycles and that's due to the lack of ovulation. So if you're not ovulating each month, you're not going to have that rise in progesterone that we want to see two weeks before your cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get the rise, then you don't get the fall and then your cycles are inconsistent or irregular. Many women are not diagnosed with PCOS when they have it in their teens and 20s because the solution, unfortunately, is everybody birth control. That's the magical fix for, for everything. Now, birth control does not fix the hormones. It does not fix the underlying blood sugar piece of PCOS. It simply just masks the problem. So oftentimes when you're coming off birth control, you can start to see a flare of those symptoms when you do come off of it. Now, birth control should be used for its intended purpose of pregnancy prevention. And there are a lot of other things that are available to fix the underlying cause in PCOS other than birth control. Mm -hmm. What are some foundational steps that someone can take to address the real root causes of that, of PCOS? Yeah, so I would look at the testing piece right? Mm -hmm. So do you have high androgens like the testosterone DHEA? 
where is your insulin? Do you have significant insulin resistance? For many PCOS patients, we see inflammation. So testing HSC or PH to see where that inflammation is. Where are your hormones? While you are on hormone-based birth control and other issues, we can't test the hormones. So they'll just come back showing that you're on that birth control. So if you are off birth control, that's an opportunity where we can at least establish where are the baseline hormones prior to making any choices or changes there. And then looking at once you have the testing done, what are those key areas that for you, the individual, need to be modified? And because we know that there's that connection between thyroid and PCOS, for anybody who has PCOS, it's important to monitor the thyroid because we want to be able to pick up any issues right away. Um, it's not fun to have an undiagnosed thyroid condition for any period of time. So I'm really proactive in making sure that everybody's tested for that. Mm -hmm. Do your clients typically, are they able to address their thyroid more naturally, like diet, lifestyle, and fixing gut infections and things like that? Or do they do medications? What's the typical outcome for those? So it does depend on the individual and, and how significant the labs are and how significant the signs and symptoms are. So for many individuals with subclinical hypothyroidism, or perhaps, you know, their T4 isn't being converted to T3. If we look at the other markers and we say, okay, yeah, the vitamin D is low, you know, your dietary intake of iron and selenium and zinc is really low. Mm -hmm. Then we can always do diet and lifestyle and supplementation first and repeat those labs in three months time to see are things improving? You know, maybe there are some gut infections or maybe the cortisol or the stress hormone is really high, or maybe there's insulin resistance and monitoring the thyroid over time as we fix those things. If the thyroid's getting better then fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to switch a little bit into weight loss. So do you feel like there's some really common myths around weight loss right now? So the biggest one is really interesting is of course, for years and years, we've always pushed the eat less, move more, eat less, move more. And, you know, track calories and reduce your calories even lower and, and the cycle goes on and on. And so many individuals are really clung, like they cling to that, like we have to, I have to eat less, I have to move more. But when I ask them, you know, does it matter what you eat? They'll say, well, no, I could eat more, I can eat less and my weight doesn't change. So I think we need to challenge that paradigm where we're looking at focusing more on, yes, nutrition is important. Yes, calories play a role, but we also need to have a look at the hormones that the foods are sending to the body when we consume them. So if you're consuming the wrong macronutrients or you have insulin resistance, your nutritional requirements are going to be different. So for patients with really significant insulin resistance, yeah, we know when you eat carbohydrates, you are going to be more prone to weight gain, especially in the midsection, because your insulin is already high. Now, does that mean you have to go keto and completely remove carbohydrates for the rest of your life? No, not necessarily. But perhaps doing a lower carbohydrate approach at the start could be beneficial. I like to have a really easy whole foods nutrition plan for individuals. I don't like completely removing food groups. I don't like, you know, this one size fits all. Everybody has to be free of X, Y, Z. But I do think looking at the blood work can be particularly helpful to say, okay, you know, here's where your blood sugar markers are. And here's why a lower carbohydrate nutrition plan for six weeks makes sense. Then we can repeat the blood work and see how much progress are we getting with that. And we can identify when is the right time to reintroduce those carbohydrates and how much? Mm -hmm. Do you find that most people are able to stick to something like that? Like if they are really low on carbohydrates for six weeks and then they come back and they add them in mentally, are they able to stabilize and like not go back into overeating patterns or what, what does that look like for people? Yeah, so this is where the accountability and the coaching comes into play to really identify what are your past relationships with food? You know, how are you feeling on this? Does this make sense for you to, you know, even start within 
the realm of your schedule at this point in time. We have to set realistic, sustainable goals. And of course, we don't want to trigger any negative relationships with food. Now, for an individual who has insulin resistance, I only like to reduce the carbohydrates for six weeks. Because if we reduce it too long, it's too much of a stress on the body and the thyroid function can start to go down, especially the T3. And when I say reducing carbohydrates, I'm talking more about processed foods. So sugars, alcohol, breads, pastas, desserts. For many individuals, we are still keeping in root vegetables. We're still keeping in um, fruits. The carbohydrates are just coming from whole foods. So it's not, you know, a no carbohydrate nutrition plan. It's not a carnivore nutrition plan of, of any sorts, but it's more shifting the carbohydrates that you are consuming to more of the nutrient dense ones. Mm -hmm. And is there... and then looking at oh sorry the reintroduction, right? So reintroducing mm -hmm. those carbohydrates after the six weeks, slowly one by one and observing how your body is reacting to it could be quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely see that with my clients as well, taking out of a lot of inflammatory foods. And it's pretty surprising to most people how in tune they want, they become with their body when they slowly start to reintroduce those things. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that, you know, X, Y, Z makes me feel bloated or inflamed or whatever it is. And that was like a whole role in their, um, for you, maybe weight loss issues or other chronic symptoms that they were dealing with. Um, do you guys count macronutrients? Like, do you have them stay below a certain gram number of carbohydrates or does that look quite different for most people? So what I like to do is the ultimate goal is to help individuals get to a place of intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. Now, intuitive eating, I do feel like you have to have some framework right? You have to know what a plate or a healthy nutrition plan should look like in the first place in order to be able to put in intuitive eating, or you have to be able to hone into your hunger satiety cues and how you're truly feeling to be able to pick up which foods feel good for you versus which ones don't. So at the start, I actually really like, um, instead of macro tracking, because it can be a little bit tedious to put that into the app, doing more food portions. So looking at, you know, at least, at least four ounces of protein at each meal, which will be roughly around 30 grams of protein. So in a way you are tracking macros, but I find that a food scale or a kitchen scale to be really easy to help retrain individuals on what their nutrition should look like. And the way that we use the scale is, are you getting enough? So it's not meant to be a restrictive tool. Are you getting enough fruits? Are you getting enough vegetables? Are you getting enough protein at your meals to ensure that you're able to sustain yourself? And mm -hmm. when we do the portion sizing, when we're tracking the fibers, often it comes out to anywhere from 30 to 35 grams of fiber a day. So in a way, yes, it is macro tracking, but we're doing it more through portion sizing. Okay. I love that. What are your thoughts on fasting for women's weight loss? So for anybody who has higher amounts of insulin, who does not have a past history of disordered eating, intermittent fasting may be beneficial, especially at the start. So if you have really high levels of insulin, anytime that you eat a meal that consumes, contains protein or carbohydrates, it's going to raise your insulin levels. So if our goal is to get the insulin levels down, intermittent fasting may be quite helpful. But if you're not sleeping and you are doing 45 minutes to an hour of high intensity interval training every single day and you're not recovering, trying to add in intermittent fasting could be too much of a stress on the body. And if you overstress the body, and you reduce your calories too much, that's where you're going to start to see a negative impact on your thyroid and your hormones. Intermittent fasting does not mean caloric restriction, but it also doesn't mean not eating at all just because you're too busy and you're calling it intermittent fasting. So it does need to be done in a really strategic way to make sure if you're reducing your feeding window, are you still getting enough calories, macronutrients, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, things like that. 
Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that. I think that's such an important piece that people just think like, oh, I'm just going to take breakfast out, but then they're not really replenishing the calories and the nutrients and everything in the other meals. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some other, if any, key things that people need to know about fasting in order to have it be done in like a safe and effective way? I would recognize that it doesn't have to be forever and no nutrition plan or time restricted feeding is going to be the same for every individual. So at the start, if your insulin levels are high and you're feeling good with the intermittent fasting and it works with your lifestyle and you are ensuring to get enough protein and vitamins and minerals in your diet, if it's working for you, great. If you start to experience low blood sugar symptoms or your stress level is too high or you're not sleeping or you're adding in more exercise, then it makes sense to open up that feeding window, right? Listen to your hunger and satiety cues. If you are really hungry in the morning, then maybe you start your feeding window sooner and end it a little bit earlier. It's not going to work for every single individual, and it's not the only way to approach insulin resistance. You don't have to do intermittent fasting. I would be more cautious of the amount of snacking that individuals are doing. Mm -hmm. So if your insulin levels are high and you're eating every two hours and it's a higher carbohydrate meal, or a snack, then that's where, yes, you're going to run into some some concerns. So maybe you're looking at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, larger meals within any feeding window time period. You're just cutting out the snacks to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's the misconception that you should eat all day long in small meals to have a high metabolism. But then, like you said, you're totally making your blood sugar go a lot crazier if you're constantly putting food into your body. Um, so yeah, I love that small tip, just balanced meals throughout the day and not snacking as much. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your metabolic reset program? Um, so the metabolic reset program is a 10 week program that's designed to help individuals who are having insulin resistance, underlying inflammation, um, hormone imbalances, they're not sleeping, maybe they have issues with their hormone cortisol or that stress hormone. What we do is we remove the top inflammatory foods for six weeks and we help reintroduce what nutrition portion should look like for individuals. Then after the six week time period, we help individuals reintroduce those foods because we want to figure out which foods are inflammatory for each individual. And just because a food might be considered a health food doesn't mean that it's going to be healthy for each individual. So we help to identify which foods are creating inflammation for the individual who's on the plan. We also look at mindset. So we have accountability and you work with um, one of the coaches each and every week because there is so much connection between your mental health and your weight, your mental health and your blood sugar. So we can't underestimate the importance of really diving into not only your relationship with food, but your relationship with the others that you interact with, or how are you perceiving your environment on a daily basis? We also focus on sleep and really solidifying a healthy foundation. There's no fancy, you know, um, shakes or packaged foods. It's just healthy whole foods that you can find at your grocery store. Anybody can consume healthy whole foods. There's there's nothing fancy in that regards, but we help you to understand what's going to work for you. And you can use the principles and the tools of the program at any point in time. So it might be that right now you can't tolerate gluten or dairy, and those are inflammatory foods for you and you keep them out for a period of time, but you can always use the tools that you've utilized and learned about in the program to reintroduce them again at a later time to see how your body does. We also focus on cortisol or the stress piece. So for this particular program, I actually have individuals reduce the amount of exercise that they're doing just for a six week time period. And many individuals are quite surprised that their ability to tolerate exercise 
improves after cutting it back for a period of time. So many individuals are having a harder time recovering. They're not seeing the results from their trainings. Um, they're feeling really tired from exercise and they want to keep it up because they're told that they have to exercise. But sometimes you just need to give your body a reset and a break. So we remove the exercise for six weeks and then we reintroduce it back in and we figure out what amount of exercise is going to be the most supportive for you. And it doesn't mean that you can't do gentle exercise like yoga, Pilates, walking, um, meditations, things like that. Of course, we want you to con continue to do that, but we don't want individuals doing, you know, an hour run or too much high intensity interval training just for six weeks. And then yes, you can put it back in. I think I've lost your audio. No. I can hear you now. No, nope, not now. How about I can? Yes. Working. Okay, great. <laughs> We'll have the editor cut that out. <laughs> Amazing. Um, now it's gone again. All right. We'll just have to use my other headphones, which is fine. Um, Sounds good. Okay, great. So what are some of your favorite stress management tools since it does play such a big role in regulating our blood sugar and all of these other aspects of our health? I like individuals to find a hobby or find a purpose. And I always ask like, what do you do for fun? And I remember when this question was asked to me, I was shocked. I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't do anything for fun. It's just going through the day-to-day -day routine. And when I really thought about it, I was like, that's not a very great life to live, not having hobbies or a purpose or things that I do for fun. So that's something that I really prioritized in my own life. And I encourage other individuals to do as well. Find something that you enjoy, whether it's going out with your friends or a sport activity or crafting, find something that you truly enjoy. That's number one. Number two, I really like putting on any sort of guided meditation before bed or something that you can start to incorporate some deep breathing with before bed. It doesn't have to be this huge time commitment. When I mention meditation or yoga to individuals that like, I don't have time to do that, just put on something and fall asleep to it. Do something for five minutes before bed that incorporates the parasympathetic nervous system response, which you can do that with just deep breathing. So meditation, yoga, something before bed, even a five minute journal, journaling three things that you're grateful for before bed could be helpful. Um, doing things for fun, going out with friends, and also looking at the relationships that you have in your daily life. So the individuals that you're spending the most time with, are they individuals that are supportive? Do you feel good after interacting with them? Or are some of these relationships draining to you? And do you need to reevaluate which individuals you are spending your valuable time with? So those would be the, the couple tips that I would say for individuals. Okay. Yeah, the, the meditation and all that stuff, it doesn't have to be super long. And sometimes I'll overlap activities. Like one of my favorite things to do is sit in the sauna and meditate or deep breathe. Um, you know, sometimes I get in the sauna and I see people on their phones and, you know, they're like chatting, but you can overlap some of these activities or make them a quick thing to do and uh, really reduce your overwhelm and help your nervous system. So I love this. Just tips. coming back to the present moment, right? You could go and say, okay, my five senses, what is something I see? What is something I hear? What is something I smell? Just to bring you back to the present moment when you're in a heightened state or you're feeling anxious or use the colors of the rainbows, find something that's red, orange, yellow, green, and go through that. Because if you're focusing on what's in your environment right now, that's going to help break the cycle of some of those perpetual stories or the anxious thoughts that we have throughout the day. 
Mm, that's a really good, that's a really good one. Okay. Last few questions. We're going to do um, a five question speed round. So just answer the first thing that comes to your head. No pressure. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what are one to two books that have been the most impactful to you? I love the five love languages. I find that's really important for relationships. And then I can see the cover of the book. Uh, I wish I knew that off. It was like the always do your best. Um, what is that book? Do you know the book I'm talking about? No, I don't think so. But we can stick with the five love languages. And if you think I will it, by the end of the show, let me know. <laughs> I read that book every couple months just to reiterate it's like the five laws of something I will send it to you maybe oh, we can put it in the notes by Miguel Ruiz is it a Miguel Ruiz book I don't know the author I can see it's like there's a little horizontal line a vertical line it's yellow the book cover yeah yeah we're, we're both having a brain fart here I feel like it's on my shelf behind me <laughs> <laughs> I bet you have it yeah okay next question um, what's one supplement you could never live without? Magnesium. Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, next question does not have to be health related, but it can be. What's the best purchase you've made in the past year for something that was less than a hundred dollars? It relates to my new hobby. I love to surf. Okay. So surf lessons. I think that was the best investment because it's something that I can't bring my phone with me. I have to be aware of my surroundings and it's a new hobby that I get to do. So that's surfboard, surf lessons. Love that. I started surfing in the past couple of years too. It's so amazing. It's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? I would love to fly. Okay. I love to travel. I just don't love all the hours that it takes to get to place to place. Okay. And then if you could leave the listeners with one thing that they could start doing this week to help them live a healthier, happier life, what would that be? Be mindful of the repetitive thoughts that you have throughout the day and the stories that you tell yourself. I think so much of our chronic health conditions and the, the struggles that individuals have comes down to stress and how they're perceiving their environment. Mm, beautiful I know the book now yes the four the four agreements yes okay it just came to me too <laughs> awesome the four agreements okay do you want to go ahead and share where people can find you and work with you absolutely so you can find me on Instagram Brianne Callanan on TikTok Brianne Callanan and then my website is also BrianneCallanan.com so all these, just my name. Wonderful. We'll put those in the show notes. And thank you so much for being on the show. This was fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching the episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you like the video and leave a comment and share it with a friend who really needs to hear it. Because when you share this information, you're also going to help other people level up their health. And if you or somebody else you know, wants to work on their health and they're looking for a functional medicine practitioner, feel free to reach out to me to apply to work together. Thanks for watching and keep striving to become your healthiest, happiest self.